So once again, we want to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar from the National Weather Service in Boston Norton. I'm Joe Deli Carpini, the Science and Operations Officer, and with me tonight is Rodney Chai, one of our meteorologists and frequent contributor to our webinars. So we're going to take you through the, the modeling world tonight. Uh, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about how the different weather models forecast thunderstorms and uh, it's it's actually kind of interesting. It's it's through a series of equations, but it also the output from that has effects on other model fields. And then Rodney's going to show us some examples uh, of some of the uh, the models, especially the high resolution models. And then he'll also give us a sneak peek at kind of what's to come in the modeling world. So I think you guys will all enjoy this. So from the first series of when we did weather models. Um, we talked about numerical weather prediction using, it's essentially just a bunch of mathematical equations of the atmosphere using, uh, you know, physics and, and different things like that uh, to predict the weather. And we have supercomputers down in the Washington DC area uh, that can do 213 trillion calculations per second. So um, we really need computers to uh, help us solve all the math. It would take, you know, decades or hundreds of years for a human to do that just for a short period of time. So as you probably very well know, we use supercomputers uh, to run all of these different equations for the different models. So we're going to focus a little bit today on what are called the CAMs or convective allowing models. Um, so these are designed to simulate small scale features. So think of things uh, like thunderstorms uh, in the summertime, sea breezes, uh, even, you know, today's backdoor cold front um, during the wintertime, ocean effects snow, and even those smaller scale heavy snow bands with winter storms. So these are not focusing on the larger picture, like the, the track of the low necessarily, um, or the jet stream pattern. It's, it's really focusing on, on the small scale features in various uh, types of weather. So they can simulate thunderstorm structures um, when we talk about that, we mean updrafts and downdrafts, so it gets that localized. Most of these operate in a scale of about three kilometers or less, sometimes one kilometer, which is just a few miles, uh, but can really simulate individual thunderstorms. And we'll talk about some recent um, research and modeling to, to really bring that point home later. So the data for these smaller models is initialized from larger scale models like the GFS. So they get their start, meaning things like temperature, humidity, wind profiles, things like that. The data is started from the larger scale models and kind of downscale to the smaller scale. And then from there, these CAMs kind of take it from there and can forecast these small scale features. So some examples of the CAMs, you might be familiar with some of these. Um, one of them is on the left, the HER. Uh, we have the National Severe Storms Laboratory WARF model weather or research forecast model, the NAM nest, which is a higher resolution uh, run of the NAM. So the NAM is run uh, at a 12 kilometer resolution, but there's also this NAM nest that runs at three kilometers. And uh, the WARF weather research forecast ARW, it's a different core for the model. So a different set of equations that it's using uh, as opposed to the NSSL WARF. Um, and there's also an FV3 core of the WARF. And the FV3 core is the core that's used in the GFS these days. So we also have ensembles that I show on the right, uh, the short range ensemble known as the Shref, that's been around for a long time, still does a really good job. And more recently we have the HREF, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that from looking at our event reviews. That's a high resolution ensemble forecast and that's kind of where we're going in the modeling world. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So when we talk about, um, convective parameterization. So these are used by the larger scale models. They're not used in the CAMs, and I'll get to that in a second. So what does that mean? It's, it's a technique used in weather modeling to predict the effects of convective clouds that may exist within a single what's called grid box in the model. So really think of it, they're terms that simulate convection. So transfer of energy by the wind, think about heating of the day, uh, to release heat and moisture in the model. So this output of heat and moisture affects other fields, including things like sea level pressure. So we have to get the convective parameterization correct in order to accurately be able to forecast other fields as well. Um, you may have heard in winter storms, uh, let me just go back for a second. 
uh, when we talk about convective feedback, and we talk about that sometimes in winter storms, that's where this convective parameterization can really go off to the races and produce too much energy, too much heat and moisture, and that will affect the development and track of the surface load. So just think of it in those terms. This really has a lot of effects on other parts of the model. So why is it needed? It predicts convective precipitation. So think about you know showers and thunderstorms. Those are convective um, it also, as I mentioned, provides feedback up to the larger scale. So um, convection can what's called overturn the atmosphere and it affects other fields, things like stability, generating and redistributing heat in the model, uh, removing moisture or redistributing moisture, and then forming clouds, uh, which affects surface heating and atmospheric radiation. So it's actually something that's pretty important. We may overlook it all, you know, especially in some of the cooler months, but it actually um, is used year-round in, in the modeling world. And again, we're talking about the larger models. So GFS, think the, the NAM 12 kilometer, the European model, UK Met, Canadian, et cetera. Um, those models use one form of convective parameterization. And there are actually a, a bunch of different types, and we'll talk about that too. But uh, as I mentioned, the feedback up to these larger scales can also impact large-scale weather systems. So as I mentioned, surface load development and strength. Um, the speed and movement of warm fronts and cold fronts and, you know, the aerial extent of precipitation. So on the right, that was our um, cluster of solutions from our January blizzard this, this past winter. Um, all of those are affected to some degree by the conductive parameterization in the model, believe it or not, uh, where you have some that are tracking it close to the coast, others offshore, and others somewhere in between. So the convective parameterization, um, for example, in the NAM, it can also lead to high errors once you get outside of 36 to 48 hours. So we typically, the window for those in the forecast is, is that 36 to 48 hour period. Um, not so much with the GFS, European, UK Met, but think about the NAM, uh, the HREF, the models in the HREF in particular, uh, you can grow errors exponentially uh, just from the start of the forecast. So really by 36 to 48 hours, uh, the model can be way, way off and you have to use it kind of with a grain of salt. So there are also different types of parameterization. And this table is just a way to show you how many there are. We obviously won't go into all the detail, but uh, on the left here, these are all the different types of model convective parameterization developed over the years. And some of the things that trigger each of them, we, um, you may be familiar with things like caper and stability, the cloud depth, the convective inhibition, uh, meaning how much is there to prevent convection. Um, and so, so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of different parameters that can be used and each model you know, may use a different one. So um, it just depends on, on kind of what's used. But you know, the activation is what will trigger the convection, what's, what's the process. The intensity is how strong it will be and eventually what will end it. Um, and then vertical distribution, how will this convection feed some of the other, other model fields like moisture, temperature, cloud cover, uh, you know, surface pressure, things like that. So it's, you know, these are kind of like best estimates, but they're obviously not perfect. And that's why, you know, models are not perfect forecasters, always some sort of error introduced into them, whether it's the observed data, whether it's some of the equations that are used, such as the convective parameterization. So, um, you know, these, these estimate many of the, the processes that go on in kind of real life. Uh, so they're not perfect. And again, we can, it can lead to errors in other fields. So, most models, as I mentioned, use the convective parameterization to simulate thunderstorms. So, but their coarser resolution, think about grid boxes that are maybe 12 or 13 kilometers, you know, 30 miles roughly, as opposed to a higher resolution model, which can simulate down to about two to three miles. Um, it's a big difference. So the CAMs don't use any convective parameterization. They're, that's why they're called convective allowing models. They just allow the convection to develop freely within the model. And their higher resolution, as I mentioned, that two to three square mile resolution uh, allows them to simulate thunderstorm processes much more effectively than these larger scale models like the GFS, for example. So some of the sensitivities in the models, microphysics um, helps with things like cold pools. Think about outflow from the thunderstorms and you get that nice rush of cool air as the thunderstorm is arriving. Um, the stratiform precipitation area, you know, if we've got a line of storms moving through, once it moves through, then you get into that more consistent kind of 
uh, steady rain behind the main area of thunder. And then propagation, moving the whole thing along in the model. How fast is the line going to go? How fast is an individual storm going to go? That's all in the microphysics of the model. Then in the boundary layer, so think about maybe the lowest, you know, thousand feet roughly. Um, entrainment of air into the storm. Is it bringing in drier air or more stable air? Is it bringing in warm and humid air that's going to help the thunderstorms continue to develop? Um, small scale interactions, you know, think about things like the cold pool in the first part. Does that, is that going to set off other storms in the area? Uh, is that going to, you know, generate, um, are we going to get more instability? Maybe along a sea breeze front, is there going to be some added lift, things like that. And then the initial conditions are probably the most important thing. The model has to have some spin up time. It takes all of the observed data. So think about surface observations. Um, satellite in particular is used heavily, radar, um, things like that. But it takes about zero, anywhere up to zero to three hours to actually spin up what's called the convection or the thunderstorm. So a lot of times, if you're looking at a high resolution model run, think about the HER maybe, you might not see initially a lot of storms pop up, but by that second and third hour, then you start to see things develop. That's the model starting to develop through free convection, what it's called. So um, the diagram here on the right, obviously it's a little complicated, but it kind of shows you what's going on. You've got some um, warm cloud processes in the lower part of the cloud and then the cold cloud processes in the upper part of the cloud. So you have things like raindrops colliding with one another and growing and um, updrafts forming and then eventually they get heavy enough and they fall out. So um, this just has to do with developing precipitation within the model. It's, it's, it's a pretty complicated thing. So I think from here I'm going to hand it over to Rodney. He's going to go through some of the ensembles, I believe. Um, well, actually, you know what, Rodney, I'll take this part and then hand it over to you. <laughs> this is still mine. I'm sorry. It's CAM Ensembles. These are multiple runs of the same model. Um, they have different model cores or microphysics. We talked a little bit about that. They have different initial conditions, so things are tweaked a little bit um, to kind of see if we get a different output. Boundary conditions, again, we talked about maybe things like temperature, moisture, wind, uh, and then the parameterization. So aside from the convection, there's other parameterizations that are used within the model to simulate all the different processes. Again, think about things like heat release, moisture transport, things like that. And then initialization times too. If we vary that, um, that can help vary the output. But the, the point of the ensembles is really to help iron out the forecast uncertainty. And if you've seen our event reviews, you know we rely on these heavily in our forecasting. It really helps us pinpoint areas that are favored uh, for whether it's you know severe weather, heavy snow, uh, rain or snow, or sleet, freezing rain, things like that. These just help having those multiple runs of the same model, tweaking things a little bit to kind of see if we can get a different result. So why do we use them for convection? Well, it helps to quantify uncertainty. So talk about things like storm mode. Are we going to see individual storms, maybe the garden variety? Are we going to see storms merge into a big squall line and race across the area? Or are we going to have supercells um, you know, coming up on the anniversary of the June 1st, uh, 2011 tornadoes? That was a big day for supercells. Uh, so we mentioned type of storms and the intensity, you know, how strong or severe are the storms going to get? The, the CAM ensembles can help us a lot with that, like the HREF and the SHREF. How about the location? What areas are most favored uh, for thunderstorms or severe weather? Uh, and then also moving on to timing. You know, what time of when will the storm start? When are they going to peak? And then when are they going to end? That's all important information for us to message, not only to you, but to the emergency management community um, to help with being safe during storms. And of course, precipitation amounts. Are we going to have just a few light showers or are we going to have excessive rainfall with some uh, flash flooding or significant urban flooding in some of our larger cities? All right, so from here, Rodney, now it's your turn. I'm sorry, so we'll hand it over to you. Um, Rodney's going to take us through some of the ensemble products and some of the model products and also give us a little glimpse at what's coming in the future. So, Rodney, I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, Joe. Um, so let's go through some of the, uh, the CAM ensemble products. Uh, the first type is the spaghetti or the paintball uh, product, and you can, as the name suggests, um, basically, it's kind of like an art, artwork with you know different splotches of pain, and and really this is um, you know it's supposed to be an intuitive way of interpreting uh, the spread of the, the different high resolution guidance. 
and where you see the highest amount of overlap, that's kind of like, okay, that would suggest a high probability of, you know, seeing that solution. So in this case, you know, uh, this is, you're looking at uh, an image, uh, a 24 hour max, max uh, one kilometer reflectivity, um, you know, where there's about 40 uh, units of DVD intersect with the most unstable K that is above uh, 50 uh, units. And so basically what we are trying to see here is where, where do we think, where does the HRF think that uh, strong storms could occur? And, uh, you know, and, and unsurprisingly, you know, much of South New England is uh, it's lit up with the, the paintball color. So in this case, uh, you know, once again, it is most useful for the storm specific output, the you know, precipitation coverage, or in this case, the updraft velocity um, that is an indicator of the severe potential. So um, another ensemble product is the ensemble max product. Uh, basically, it plots the highest value among all the members over a given period, and it also gives us a reasonable worst case scenario. Um, you know, um, nowadays the, the weather service emphasizes being uh, the weather ready nation and, uh, you know, providing effective decision support services to our partners. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, a lot of times they actually want to know what is the reasonable worst case scenario so that they can prepare accordingly. Doesn't mean it will happen, but it, it does, uh, you know, give you a peace of mind, you know, that the emergency managers are prepared for the worst case scenario. And in this case, the SPC page includes output for uh, reflectivity or your radar simulation, abstract strength, and also abstract velocity again, which is an indicator for severe weather. Um, another kind of ensemble product is the probabilities, uh, which is the percentage of members that show a given value. So uh, on the image here, you can see uh, this is the ensemble probability where the surface K exceeds 500 units. And uh, you can see where um, the highest probabilities are indicated by the bright color. So in, uh, the orange and red represent over 80% probability. In other words, 80% of the HREF ensemble members uh, suggest that uh, this is where the surface K would exceed 500 units. So in this case, you can see uh, over much of Cape Cod and the islands, um, as well as the South Coast. And um, another um, similar product is the neighborhood probabilities. So this is a more specific probabilistic product. Uh, it's the probability of over a given time period near a specific location. So in this case, we so think of, um, you know, like a graph paper, you segment it into uh, 20 kilometer grids. Um, so that's basically, um, you know, what it is. And it gives a quick look at the threat of the day. Um, yet another um, type of ensemble product is the probability match mean or the PMN product. It is used mainly for precipitation. And this, the idea of the PMM is that, so basically it's kind of, um, um, it's a, a more specific um, kind of mean product. So the thing is, so let's say, you know, you have, um, you know, you, let's say, for example, you have, um, you know, let's say five numbers, okay? Maybe it goes from zero to 100. Uh, if you just take the mean of these five numbers, you know, maybe you come up with like say 45 or 50. Now it doesn't say much about the, the spread of the, uh, the members. So maybe you have a member that is one or 99, but then it still gives you an, you know, an average of 50 in this case. So the probability match mean aims to capture not only the mean, but also the, the extreme um, members as well. So it captures the, the highest amplitude. So in this case, it would not only will it give you a mean of 50, but it also give, tell you that, okay, um, the highest member is 99. So in this case, um, and that's in terms of precipitation, not just um, for summer, but also for winter as well, because, you know, the, the PMM would be more useful than the, the mean product because it 
it gives you kind of, um, you know, one way to see it is the reasonable worst case scenario as well, you know. So, um, so it avoids over smoothing of precipitation products. So um, just taking a look at, um, so this is the HER, the high resolution, um, you know, rapid refresh product. And so basically um, what you're looking at on the left hand side, that's version number three. And then the latest version is version four, the HER V4, which is, you know, in the, in the middle of the, the slide. And then on the, the right hand side, the, the right two images, those are the observed, um, reflectivity. So that was actually what happened. And so you can see that in in both cases, um, the HER V4, the version 4, better handled the evolution and organization of the convective system. So if you compare um, the, you know, the, the forecast reflectivity versus the observed reflectivity, the version 4 HER actually does better uh, than the version 3. So the HER, um, one of the known um, shortcomings of the HER product is that it has a tendency to delay the timing of convective initiation or CI. So basically, um, CI is a fancy term for um, basically when thunderstorms get going. So, um, you know, if you think about it, uh, that's not a, so it's not necessarily a very good thing because you know sometimes if you think that the thunderstorms would would start at 5 p.m. but then it starts bubbling up at 2 p.m. you know then my caught catch some people off guard. So and unfortunately, despite the her version four being better at simulating um, you know the development of the convection and you know how it progresses once it forms, it, it does have a it actually has a worse tendency to delay the timing of CI in V3. So that's like one of the shortcomings of the, the new version of HER. So, um, you know, again, more on the delayed uh, triggering of convection. Uh, many cases did not show delayed timing of the convective initiation. And in almost all cases with the, um, the HER V4 triggering, um, the version 4, you know, eventually it would initiate a storm a couple of hours later and eventually get caught up to the um, version three solution. Uh, but bear in mind, it's with a slightly slower evolution. So uh, let's take a look at the wind probabilities and convective wind events. Um, so, um, you know, 30 knot threshold, you know, usually is a good proxy for significant convective gas. Um, at least in higher instability environments. It's also kind of like the minimum threshold where you can kind of see um, some kind of damage, you know, be it like large tree branch down, uh, maybe like a weak tree you know, down, especially in a very leafy neighborhood. Um, so the her HREF, not her, the HREF uh, version three, uh, it computes wind probabilities using the maximum value over the the last hour within a 10 kilometer neighborhood. Um, so, uh, you know, so you can see that in this case, the version three actually, um, you know, that's the, that's version three and then uh, to the left is version two. So you can compare and contrast and, um, and then compare this with uh, the right hand side image that's the observed wind reports um so the blue ones are the, the wind reports on the um that's yeah and then uh and then on the right hand side the rtma so that's basically kind of like a reanalysis product um and basically it's a very good proxy for observed events and with all the, the proper dots those are the um observed um 30 knot plus uh wind speed And moving on, so, um, you know, so in this case, I'm uh, going to the northeast, so you can see a bunch of wind products, uh, wind reports of the SPC, uh, you know, storm reports from May 15, 2020. And so, 
you know, taking a look at version two and version three, um, version three does better um, than version two to to hint that the um, you know that it is possible to see uh, damage in wind gusts um, across parts of the northeast. Um, but overall, you can see, you know, it's not a very good job. I mean, um, you know, given the density of the wind reports um, that, that was observed that day, uh, the camps uh, the heat trap was barely showing anything even for version three. And this, this suggests that the camps struggle to generate significant wind, especially in the low Cape, low instability environment in the Northeast. Um, and so in this case, the 10 meter wind probabilities likely wouldn't show the same threat as they do in higher instability events. And we, you know, we, and this is something that, you know, I would say that, especially in early season, early um, spring um, convection event, because um, usually, you know, because of the stable marine layer, you know, the cool, we're kind of like in the cool sector, the ocean temperatures are still kind of cold. So usually the dew points are not that high. And the thing about it, the SPC, um, they are located in Norman, Oklahoma. And they are, you know, sometimes they are, you know, they, they are, so we are weather experts, don't get me wrong, but they are more used to, you know, those uh, high instability, so like maybe like 6,000 units of cake. Um, and then you have like tall supercells and um, and then for us in the Northeast, like, you know, might not seem as, the environment might seem very tame, but, you know, you know, more often than not, sometimes you get um, overperforming events. So like in this case, May 15, 2020, so kind of early in the game, but look at the number of wind reports um, that, um, that were produced in despite a low instability environment. So the other thing that um, the HREP version three um, added was the probability of lightning. Um, and this is kind of useful because it, this provides another way for, for the forecaster um, to look at the, um, you know, where we could likely see, um, you know, not just severe convection, but also maybe strong thunderstorms so you can see you know, obviously, the higher the density of lightning, um, the higher the likelihood you're going to see at least strong thunderstorm. And so, um, you know, again, this is, um, you know, given the emphasis on, you know, no better radiation and, you know, um, being prepared for a significant weather event. So, there's potential for decision support services usage. And, um, you know, but bear in mind this use the usefulness of this product is absolutely dependent on the quality of the precipitation forecast. So you can you can simulate a lot of lightning, but it's just not if the if the precipitation forecast is off, then this is um, this will be off as well. So you have to kind of take take it with a grain of salt. So what what does the future of um, camps hold? So um, you know, machine learning or artificial intelligence. So, um, so the NCAR, um, you know, basically the brains behind the models, they run the, the HER model using machine learning to help identify favorable storm modes. So, now this is not to say machines will replace forecasters in producing warnings, but, um, but a lot. But if you were to do like a detailed comprehensive study, you would eventually you will find that under certain circumstances, you're going to have very high probability of seeing a severe thunderstorm, be it severe hail, wind, or tornado. And based on the, um, you know, the parameters, you can um, reasonably, um, you know, suggest that, oh, okay, this is a situation where you want to issue a tornado warning or severe thunderstorm warning, etc. And so the other um, aspect would be, you know, the warn on forecast system or the WOFS. Um, so basically, this is a 36 member, three kilometer grid walk based ensemble. So it uses, you know, Surface observations, radar, and satellite data, 
and they run the new forecast every half hour out to the next day for the specific domain. And this is contingent on severe weather threat. threat. And uh, this is also storm specific. So each storm will be forecast independently from the others. Right now, this um, one on forecast system is being tested um, in the NWS hazardous weather test bed for future implementation. So um, it's not something that you will see in the next couple of years. Uh, so the warnings would be issued using moving polygon that kind of move with the severe weather threat as it evolves. So uh, this is a quick two-minute video that uh, gives you a preview of what um, one-on forecast is. And hopefully the audio is coming through. Yeah, Joe, I don't hear anything, but at least that's the subtitle, I think. All right, I hope that, uh, Rodney, did that go through kind of okay? <laughs> I apologize if it didn't. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, I, I hear it, but it was very soft. Um, but gotcha. it was, the top hiders were very large, I think. Yeah, I'll, um, you know what I'll do is I will put the link into the chat um, quickly here, just in case people want to check it out later. Let me throw it in. And uh, let's see that work uh, yeah there we go okay there you go so if you want to check it out at home go ahead and click on that link um, and you can find out more about warn on forecasts it's actually they're doing some testing this spring um, and it go moves to a different region kind of every day so today it was in I believe the northern plains it kind of usually go, goes to the highest risk of severe weather uh, and they run it and the offices can provide feedback on the output so it's pretty cool but um, yeah, it should be coming I, in a couple of years. I think we'll be seeing this really, um, well, you know, more, you know, being able to see it, um, you know, some model output for everybody. So we'll see how that goes. All right. Um, so with that, Rodney, thanks. Um, we're going to take some questions here, and then Rodney, I think you're given the briefing tonight, if I remember. I hope you are, because I didn't get it ready. Yeah. Um, but let's uh, go through some questions here quickly. Let's see. So. Um, from Carrie, are the data used for convective outlooks by the SPC? Yes, they are, Carrie. Uh, the, the model output, especially the higher resolution models, is used for the day one and day two outlooks. Um, day three is usually a little bit beyond, and especially day four to eight. But um, absolutely, if they use pretty much all the data they can get. Uh, so these high resolution models really help you know, with storm type and, and severe potential. 
uh, from John, let's see, um, as he recalls, the storms that popped up in Eastern Mass on Saturday and Sunday, May 21st and 22nd, weren't well forecast. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, why was this? I don't know. Rodney, were you working then? Because I was not on that weekend when we had the storms. Yeah, Joe, yeah, Joe I, um, yeah, I do remember this, uh, the, this, uh, this thunderstorms. All right, go so, for it. <laughs> yeah, so, so basically, I, you know, I think, John, um, you know, I, I would say that um, the, so, you know, I would I would say I would say this again, my opinion. Um, that I, I think sometimes the FCC, um, you know, they, they have a hard they, they have a very tough job really to forecast the real weather for the whole country. And you know, sometimes um, this is a case whereby they might have overplayed the potential for severe storms a little bit here. Um, and and the key reason for that was you know, um, there was a lack of shear. And remember, shear is the, um, the change in wind direction and or speed with height. So there wasn't a lot of um, shear with this, um, this, this system. Now, there was a lot of instability because, you know, the, it was, it was, those were pretty uh, warm days. Um, but, you know, but without shear, you know, you can have you know, the thunderstorms will just pop up. You know, you will see a lot of popcorns on radar. You know, you can also see the orange and red, but they will just collapse on itself. So, you know, for storms to survive and you know become strong and even or severe, where you have the updraft, where you have the rising motion of air needs to be removed from where it where it precipitates, because otherwise it would just you know, kabush, and it would just uh, die on itself. So basically, it was a lot of those pop-up storms, and you know, it looked like it's going to go severe with one scan, but then the next scan, it just like it just weakens significantly. So um, that you know, I would say that that storm that weekend, we issued a lot of um, special weather statements to tell folks you, know, you might get a gusty winds up to forty miles per hour and small hail, uh, but really nothing severe and. And I, if, I'm, if I don't, if I remember correctly, I think SPC had like the day three March now, and then they had like slight risk. Um, so you know, you know, I would say that maybe it wasn't their best outlook, but you know, you know, then again, they have they have their hands full. Um, so um, you know, I would say uh, okay to cut that some slight at times. All right, thanks, Rodney. Uh, let's see a few more questions. John wants to know: Is topography taken into account with the CAM microphysics? Um, it's separate. It, it doesn't have to do with the microphysics. It has to do with the terrain and the model. So, um, the model itself is is kind of programmed with the topography over the area that it's running. So, yes, that is taken into account. Um, and what's the underlying reason the herd delays the timing of convective initiation? Well, it just has to do with spin up time. Everything has to spin up. Um, the model has to be able to generate um, the convection and usually takes you know a couple of hours. Uh, there's been some experimenting and especially with the, the worn on forecast system of what's called hot starting the model with radar data. So it's starting off with essentially what the radar is showing and it's got the convection already developed. So that gets rid of that bias. But um, you know, the next version of the HER is gonna be working on that and uh, hopefully they'll be able to improve it a little bit. But it's it's very tricky. It's not you know very a very straightforward process at all. So um, you know we have some of the best I think Rodney the computer programmers uh, work at NCAR and other places working on this, and uh, they'll they'll get it right. It takes a little you know time, but uh, they that'll certainly we should see some improvements in a later version of the HER. All right, from Sebastian, how much do you think that machine learning short term forecast models can improve on the false alarm tornado warnings? Uh, Rodney, you want to handle that one? Yeah, sure, Joe. Um, so I, I think, um, so Sebastian, I think uh, this is why this is why the one-on focus um, prototype cannot be cannot go operational right now because um, you know you talk about a false alarm ratio. Um, right now, if we were to go live, I, you know, I would actually think the false alarm ratio will increase. Um, because it would suggest 
trigger warning for a lot of storms. And, you know, unfortunately, this is something that, you know, for especially um, here in the Northeast, I, you know, I would say that as someone who um, has recently gone through the, the radar of radar and applications cost, which is basically kind of like the, um, you know, like the, one of the, the most important costs that a new weather service forecaster will have to go through in order to, to be able to sit independently on radar and issue warning. Um, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, I would say that it's actually harder to warn on, you know, say like low top conv convection or like something that may kind of look marginally severe, uh, but it shows a pretty uh, tight rotation at the low levels. Um, you know, I would say it's actually, it's, that's actually one of the reasons why the force alarm ratio is higher across this part of the country than say like in Oklahoma or Kansas. Um, because you're not, you're not, you know, you're not going to miss like a hook echo and, you know, a, a tall supercell with a, a pretty clear tornado signature on the ground. Um, but, you know, I would say that, um, you know, I think with, because it, we're still in the initial stages of testing, um, right now, again, you know, I would think the force alarm, the alarm ratio should go down eventually um, with more rigorous testing. But, you know, if, if anything, it's going to take a long time before this machine learning can, uh, can reduce the, the false alarm ratio. So that's my take on this. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's reasonable, Rodney. Thank you. All right, a couple more questions, and then, Rodney, I'm going to hand it over to you for the briefing. So Tom wants to know, is there a simple equation to calculate downdraft speed from the computed updraft speed? Um, it's a pretty complicated relationship, but there was an old, I know there was an old pilot's rule of thumb that you, the downdraft speed is about half of the updraft speed. I don't know if that really works very well or not. I mean, I haven't used it in as far as warnings, but um, that was the old rule of thumb from pilots many years ago. Um, pretty much now we just use the radar to measure the wind speed as best we can, and that's our best estimate. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not aware, Tom, of any simple equation. Uh, that would help you calculate the downdraft speed, unfortunately. Uh, and similarly, Tom, let's see another question. Is there amount of water vapor on which model performance is optimized? Um, not really. Uh, it, it's the model. The water vapor is going to vary uh, throughout the domain of the model, the area that it's covered. Um, so, and it's going to help things like precipitation and, and whatnot. So um, it's not, you know, a specific amount that's programmed into the model. It's using kind of what's observed or, by satellite in particular um, in the model. So there's really not a specific value that, you know, I would say it's, it's, it's particularly better or worse than another value. Uh, and then one question from Bob here, is the radar data the best measure of CI? Um, no, actually, no. Um, and I've been attending some of the Warren on Forecast. They've been doing some webinars internally for us to, to go over the performance. They're actually using satellite data. That's actually the best. Um, it uses the moisture profile from the satellite. It uses um, looking at things like the cumulus field. Is it building? Is it not building? Um, the radar is kind of added on a little bit after uh, to the, you know, to the initialization of the model. So it's really more in the way of the satellite data that's uh, more heavily used than anything else. So um, good question, Bob. I, I would think, you know, we put the radar data in and it's off to the races with the current picture, but that's not really the case, uh, which kind of surprised me a little bit. So. Great questions. All right. Um, and if you have any more, uh, you know, think of something later, feel free to um, drop me an email. My email address is there on the screen and uh, I'd be happy to answer it for you too. So, okay, Rodney, with that, um, why don't we hand it over to you so you can present and let me take care of that. Um, send it, you should have control there, Rodney, and you can show your screen when you're ready. All right, we can see it. I see a radar loop. So there we go. Okay, awesome. Excellent. <laughs> All right, Rodney, take okay. it away. Okay, thank you, Joe. And, uh, so hi, everyone. Um, so you can see that some, basically some uh, thunderstorms actually firing up over the Connecticut uh, River Valley into the east slopes of the Berkshires. 
And basically what's happening is, uh, you know, you, you will have that um, backdoor cold front come through from the east, and it has continued pushing west, and now it has reached uh, Connecticut Valley. But, um, you know, places like Hartford today, I mean, they were actually, uh, they went and got up to the 90s. So there was a lot of instability out of the of that backdoor cold front. And, and typically with backdoor cold front, we don't really get 